Okay, now, third thing that happened in evolutionary history was the evolution of a body cavity. So organisms all of a sudden are going to have some sort of a cavity and that's going to be advanced because that's going to allow them to store things. One thing, it's going to allow them to store food. So they're not constantly having to scavenge or else they're going to die. They can actually hide from a predator and wait and not have to eat right away. The other reason having a body cavity is nice is they can store their gametes until conditions are right instead of just having to throw their gametes out everywhere every time when they want to reproduce. Um, so those are going to be examples of why a body cavity is nice. Now there's three types of body cavities that you can have. You can have no body cavity, a false body cavity, or a body cavity. So if you see here the word coelum, that means body cavity. So in Latin, if you put A in front of something, that means they don't have it. So acelomates don't have a body cavity. Pseudocelomates, pseudo means false, right? So these guys are going to have a false body cavity. And then coelomates are going to have a true body cavity. Okay, so going back here, which um, I'm not sure if you can really see so well or not. Let's see if I can take a look. Okay, up and over there a little bit. Okay, now these guys can be broken into Oops, sorry, I screwed up. Pseudo and coelomates. Okay, so we've got the bilaterally symmetrical organisms broken into acelomates, pseudocelomates, and coelomates. And like I said, I will zoom in on this at the end so you can actually take a good look at it. Okay, now the coelomates are going to be the ones that are the most advanced. That's why they're over to the right. And these guys can have either an open or a closed circulatory system. Okay, so obviously the way I wrote that is that a closed circulatory system is going to be um, more advanced. Okay, and actually I'm going to try and zoom in here if I can so you can actually see the board. The wire doesn't like to stretch, but maybe it'll actually focus a little bit on what I wrote. I'll let it sit there for a sec. Hopefully that is actually focused. I'll, I'll have to take a look and see. If not, I can totally write that for you guys um, in class. Okay, so let's talk about what an open or a closed circulatory system is in addition to what that body cavity situation is going to look like. All right, let's go through our pictures here. Okay, so this picture here is going to be of an acelomate. And so an acelomate is going to have no body cavity. So if you look, this is completely solid all the way through. Okay, now in this next one, you're going to have a pseudocelomate. So now you can actually see that false body cavity here in that white space, which is called a pseudocelum. So what they can use this for is not really for storage so much, but also they can actually pump water into themselves, and that will help them to change shapes a little bit more easily. And then finally, a true coelomate is what you see here. And there's that coelom. It's completely sealed off from everything else. And that's what we are. We're coelomates. We have that entire thoracic cavity that's going to be broken off from everything else. Okay, now, uh, these pictures are hilarious, just bear with me, um, circulatory systems. So this is a picture of an open circulatory system. So I'll tell you how I know that, besides the fact that it says it right in red at the top where I wrote it. But um, you can see they have a heart, they do have some types of veins, but then you can see that it just opens out into the entire body cavity. And so that's called an open circulatory system, where the blood is going to mix with the fluids that the body has. So there's no separate separation of blood from body fluids. Not very advanced because it's not very efficient. Um, it's hard to control. And if something comes in and just cracks off the tail of this guy, it's going to bleed out a lot more easily. 
Now here we have a closed circulatory system, and you can see he's very happy that he has one. And you can see you've got the heart and you've got the veins and vessels, but the blood is staying completely separate from the body um, fluids, and that's what makes it a closed system. So this is obviously what we have, and there's a lot of reasons why this is more advanced. First of all, it's much easier to control. Second of all, you don't have any sort of mixing, so you have more efficiency of oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood. And last, you're also going to be able to have a lot more control as far as constricting or dilating those blood vessels to change blood pressure, to change body temperatures, and that type of thing. Okay. Now, this last part here is going to be talking about the development um, of these organisms and how we can kind of put them into two categories based on that. So I'm going to scroll down here a little bit, and um, this is going to be that fourth milestone in, in the um, evolution of organisms. And so this is going to be what's called deuterostome development. Now before we go any further, I'm going to show you a picture to define these words, blastula, blastopore, and archenteron. So let's go here, and um, this is a great picture of a blastula. So what happens is once you have an embryo form, that embryo is going to start dividing and form a little ball of cells. That's what a blastula is, and that's what's in these pictures that you see here. In this next one, what's going to happen eventually is that blastula is going to fold in on itself like you see in this picture. And what's going to happen is there's going to be an out... Um, Ah, I'm sorry, kind of a body cavity on the inside. And that's going to be called the archenteron. So you can see that in this picture right here, right? That's that inside cavity. It's obviously going to have an opening to the outside, and that's called the blastopore. So those are going to be three important terms when we start talking about differences between protostomes and deuterostomes in their development. And this is just a grouping we can put organisms into. Oops. Nope, that's what we want. Okay. So let's talk about the first difference. So we're going to just be basically putting animals into the categories of um, protostomes or deuterostomes. Proto is more um, primitive and deutero is more advanced. So the first difference between the two is in the cleavage of the cells while they're dividing. So if we go to this picture here, go back to this one, you can see that in protostomes here on the left, when they divide, it's going to be um, spiral cleavage, which is um, where it kind of almost looks like it's turning every time that they divide. And so it's at an oblique angle every time those cells divide. That's going to be different from if you look over here, radial cleavage. You can see that radial is talking about that every time it divides, it's on a right angle, right? And that's going to be deuterostomes, which is going to be us. That's how our um, embryos are going to divide when they become a blastula. Now, another difference that listed there is determinate versus indeterminate development. So determinate means the second that cell divides, it's told what type of cell it's going to be. So there's really no stem cells. And indeterminate is where the cell divides and it's just undifferentiated for a while until it's told what type of cell it's going to be, like a stem cell. Okay. Now, moving on, another difference between the two is that in protostomes, the less advanced ones, the mouth is going to develop from that blastopore. So remember the blastopore was going to be once it folds in that opening. Um, so it's going to be the mouth in a blastopore and it's going to be the anus in a deuterostome. And so um, protostomes, it's just basically what direction the food is going to travel. That's all you have to really think about for that. The next difference is going to have to do with um, the development. And so really all you want to get from this is that in protostomes, it's pretty just basic where cells just starting moving back and forth and it's, it's a very simple project, ugh, process. And in deuterostomes, there's going to be all sorts of complex movements and then differentiation eventually happening. So it's a little bit more of a complex process as they start to develop. And that's it as far as that goes. So let me get back to your notes because there's a little bit left, I believe. Yep, formation of the coelom. Okay.
Now, the last thing that was going to be a nice thing to have was going to be the evolution of segmentation, which is just segments in the body. We have segments. Um, and, and when you have segmentation, there's advantages to that. Obviously, mobility is going to be a huge one. Um, in some things that are highly segmented, like tapeworms or earthworms or something like that, it's going to be an advantage because that, that one segment could have an entire set of organs in it so that if the rest of the worm gets destroyed, it still has that as backup. Okay, now um, here we're going to be talking about some hypotheses about how these metazoans came to be, which are eumetazoans are the same thing. Um, there's three hypotheses about how this works. Um, the first one is the multinucleate hypothesis. And what that's saying is that you had a protist that all of a sudden had a couple of nuclei in it, and that's how we ended up with multicellular animals. The second one, the colonial flagellate hypothesis, um, that one actually has to do with something that we saw when the, we talked about protists. And I'll open that. Um, I think it's the, no, it's this one. Damn it. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can get 28 to open. But anyway, what this is, while this is opening, I'll explain it to you. And what this is talking about is that there were those little coanoflagellates, and the thought is that maybe those gave rise to the modern animal by living together. Yeah, okay, that's the bacteria one. You don't want to visit that one again. Let's see um, if I can get that to open. Come on, this is a very slow computer, I apologize. Um, so this is going to be the last slide here. And hopefully it's opening up and you can see what I'm talking about. Um, and then while I'm waiting for this to open up, the last um, hypothesis, the polyphyletic one, is just basically saying that we didn't come from sponges, we were completely separate lineages and there's no relationship whatsoever. So that's the different types that we have here. So if this thing will ever get to the end, I can actually show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, coanoflagellate. Here we go. Okay, so that's a coanoflagellate that you see there. And when we talk about sponges in the next um, chapter, you'll actually see that sponges are lined with those. And so the thought is that maybe it was a bunch of those protists living together and that's how we ended up with um, animals that way. All right, so that's it for chapter 32. Now we're going to get into um, different types of phyla and classes, and it gets a little intense, but it's going to be super fun, and um, I absolutely love it.